Chapter One of The Long Shadow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Long Shadow by B. M. Bower. Chapter One Charming Billy Has a Visitor. The wind, rising again as the sun went down, mourned lonesomely at the northwest corner of the cabin as if it felt the desolateness of the barren icy hills and the black hollows between and of the angry red sky with its purple shadows lowering over the unhappy land and would make fickle friendship with some human thing charming billy hearing the crooning wail of it knew well the portent inside perhaps he too felt something of the desolateness without and perhaps he too longed for some human companionship he sent a glance of half-conscious disapproval around the untidy cabin he had been dreaming aimlessly of a place he had seen not so long ago a place where the stove was black and shining with a fire crackling cheeringly inside and a tea kettle with straight unmarred spout and dependable handle singing placidly to itself and puffing steam with an air of lazy comfort as if it were smoking a cigarette the stove had stood in the southwest corner of the room and the room was warm with the heat of it and the floor was white and had a strip of rag carpet reaching from the table to a corner of the stove there was a red cloth with knotted fringe on the table and a bed in another corner had a red and white patchwork spread and puffy white pillows there had been a woman but charming billy shut his eyes mentally to the woman because he was not accustomed to them and he was not at all sure that he wanted to be accustomed they did not fit in with the life he lived he felt dimly that in a way they were like the heaven his mother had taught him altogether perfect and altogether unattainable and not to be thought of with any degree of familiarity so his memory of the woman was indistinct as of something which did not properly belong to the picture he clung instead to the memory of the warm stove and the strip of carpet and the table with the red cloth and to the puffy white pillows on the bed the wind mourned again insistently at the corner billy lifted his head and looked once more around the cabin the reality was depressing doubly depressing in contrast to the memory of that other room a stove stood in the southwest corner but it was not black and shining it was rust red and ash littered and the ashes had overflowed the hearth and spilled to the unswept floor a dented lard pail without a handle did meagre duty as a tea kettle and balanced upon a corner of the stove was a dirty frying pan the fire had gone dead and the room was chill with the rising of the wind the table was filled with empty cans and tin plates and cracked oven stained bowls and iron handled knives and forks and the bunk in the corner was a tumble of gray blankets and unpleasant red-flowered comforts corner wads charming billy used to call them and for pillows there were two square calico-covered cushions depressingly ugly in pattern and not over clean billy sighed again threaded a needle with coarse black thread and attacked petulantly a long rent in his coat darn this bushwhacking all over god's earth after a horse a man can't stay with nor even hold by the bridle reins he complained dispiritedly i could a cleaned the blame shack up so it looked like folks was livin here and i woulda if i didn't have to set all day and toggle up the places in my clothes billy muttered incoherently over a knot in his thread i been plumb puzzled all winter to know whether it's man or cattle i'm supposed to chaperone if it's man this coat has sure got the marks of the trade all right he drew the needle spitefully through the cloth the wind gathered breath and swooped down upon the cabin so that billy felt the jar of it i don't see what's got the matter of the weather he grumbled you just get a chinook that starts water running down the coolies and then the wind switches and she freezes up solid and that means tailing up poor cows and calves by the dozen and for your side partner you get dealt out to you a pilgrim that don't know nothing and can't ride a wagon seat hardly and it's bound to keep a dog and the old man stands for that kind of thing 
and has forbid accidents happening to it. Oh, hell. This last was inspired by a wriggling movement under the bunk. A black dog of the apologetic drooping sort that always has its tail sagging and matted with burrs crawled out and sidled past Billy with a deprecating wag or two when he caught its unfriendly glance and shambled over to the door that he might sniff suspiciously the cold air coming in through the crack beneath. Billy eyed him malevolently. A dog in a line camp is a plumb disgrace. I don't see why the old man stands for it. Or the pilgrim, either. It's a toss-up which is the worst. You smell him coming, do you? He snarled. It's about time he was coming. Me here eating dried apricots and tapioca steady diet. Nobody but a pilgrim would fetch tapioca into a line camp. And if he does it again, you'll sure be missing the only friend you got. And him gone four days when he ought to have been back the second. Get out and welcome him, darn ya. He gathered the coat under one arm that he might open the door and hurried the dog outside with a threatening boot toe. The wind whipped his brown cheeks so that he closed the door hastily and retired to the cheerless shelter of the cabin. Another blizzard's coming if I know the signs. And if the pilgrim don't show up tonight with the grub and tobacco, but I reckon the dog smelled him coming all right. He fingered uncertainly a very flabby tobacco sack, grew suddenly reckless, and made himself an exceedingly thin cigarette with the remaining crumbs of tobacco and what little he could glean from the pocket of the coat he was mending. Surely the pilgrim would remember his tobacco. Incapable as he was, he could scarcely forget that after the extreme emphasis charming billy had laid upon the getting and the penalties attached to its oversight outside the dog was barking spasmodically but billy being a product of the cattle industry pure and simple knew not the way of dogs he took it for granted that the pilgrim was arriving with the grub though he was too disgusted with his delay to go out and make sure dogs always barked at everything impartially when they were not gnawing surreptitiously at bones or snooping in corners for scraps or planting themselves deliberately upon your clothes even when the noise subsided to throaty growls he failed to recognize the symptoms he was taking long rapturous mouthfuls of smoke and gazing dreamily at his coat for it was his first cigarette since yesterday when someone rapped lightly he jumped although he was not a man who owned unsteady nerves it was very unusual, that light tapping. When anyone wanted to come in, he always opened the door without further ceremony. Still, there was no telling what strange freak might impel the pilgrim, he who insisted on keeping a dog in a line camp. So Billy recovered himself and called out impatiently, Ah, come on in. Don't be a plumb fool. And never moved from his place. The door opened queerly, slowly and with a timidity not at all in keeping with the blundering assertiveness of the pilgrim when a young woman showed for a moment against the bleak twilight and then stepped inside charming billy caught at the table for support and the coat he was holding dropped to the floor he did not say a word he just stared the girl closed the door behind her with something of defiance that did not in the least impose upon one good evening she said briskly though even in his chaotic state of mind billy felt the tremble in her voice it's rather late for making calls but she stopped and caught her breath nervously as if she found it impossible to go on being brisk and at ease i was riding and my horse slipped and hurt himself so he couldn't walk and i saw this cabin from up on the hill over there so i came here because it was so far home and i thought maybe she looked with big appealing brown eyes at billy who felt himself a brute without the least knowing why i'm flora bridger you know my father has taken up a ranch over on shell creek and i'm very glad to meet you said charming billy stammeringly won't you sit down i i wish i'd known company was coming he smiled reassuringly and then glanced frowningly about the cabin even for a line camp he told himself disgustedly it was pretty sousy. You must be cold, he added, seeing her glance toward the stove. I'll have a fire going right away. I've been pretty busy and just let things slide. 
he threw the unsmoked half of his cigarette into the ashes and felt not a quiver of regret he knew who she was now she was the daughter he had heard about and who belonged to the place where the stove was black and shining and the table had a red cloth with a knotted fringe it must have been her mother whom he had seen there but she had looked very young to be mother of a young lady charming billy brought himself rigidly to consider the duties of a host swept his arm across a bench to clear it of sundry man garments and asked her again to sit down when she did so he saw that her fingers were clasped tightly to hold her from shivering and he raved inwardly at his shiftlessness the while he hurried to light a fire in the stove too bad your horse fell he remarked stupidly gathering up the handful of shavings he had whittled from a piece of pine board i always hate to see a horse get hurt it was not what he had wanted to say but he could not seem to put just the right thing into words what he wanted was to make her feel there was nothing out of the ordinary in her being there and that he was helpful and sympathetic without being in the least surprised in all his life on the range he had never had a young woman walk into a line camp at dusk a strange young woman who tried pitifully to be at ease and whose eyes gave the lie to her manner and he groped confusedly for just the right way in which to meet the situation i know your father he said fanning a tiny blaze among the shavings with his hat which had been on his head until he remembered and removed it in deference to her presence but i ain't a very good neighbor i guess i never seem to have time to be sociable it's lucky your horse fell close enough so you could walk into camp i've had that happen to me more than once and it ain't never pleasant but it's worse when there ain't any camp to walk to i've had that happen too the fire was snapping by then and manlike he swept the ashes to the floor the girl watched him politely disapproving i don't want to be a trouble she said with less of constraint for charming billy whether he knew it or not had reassured her immensely i know men hate to cook so when i get warm and the water is hot i'll cook supper for you she offered and then i won't mind having you help me to get home i guess it won't be any trouble but i don't mind cooking you better set still and rest murmured charming billy quite red of course she would want supper and there were dried apricots and a very little tapioca he felt viciously that he could kill the pilgrim and be glad the pilgrim was already two days late with the supplies he had been sent after because he was not to be trusted with the duties pertaining to a line camp and billy had not the wide charity that could conjure excuses for the delinquent i'll let you wash the dishes promised miss bridger generously but i'll cook the supper really i want to you know i won't say i'm not hungry because i am this western air does give one such an appetite doesn't it and then i walked miles it seems to me so that ought to be an excuse oughtn't it now if you'll show me where the coffee is she had risen and was looking at him expectantly with a half smile that seemed to invite one to comradeship charming billy looked at her helplessly and turned a shade less brown there, there isn't any he stammered guiltily the pilgrim i, I mean walland fred walland it doesn't matter in the least miss bridger assured him hastily one can't keep everything in the house all the time so far from any town we're often out of things at home last week only i upset the vanilla bottle and then we were completely out of vanilla till just yesterday she smiled again confidingly and billy tried to seem very sympathetic though of a truth to be out of vanilla did not at that moment seem to him a serious catastrophe and really i like tea better you know i only said coffee because father told me cowboys drink it a great deal tea is so much quicker and easier to make billy dug his nails into his palms there miss bridger he blurted desperately i got to tell you there isn't a thing in the shack except some dried apricots and maybe a spoonful or two of tapioca the pilgrim he stopped to search his brain for words applicable to the pilgrim and still mild enough for the ears of a lady well never mind we can rough it it'll be lots of fun 
the girl laughed so readily as almost to deceive billy standing there in his misery that a woman should come in to him for help and he not even be able to give her food was almost unbearable it were well for the pilgrim that charming billy boyle could not at that moment lay hands upon him it will be fun she laughed again in his face if the the grub stake is down to a whisper that's the way you say it isn't it there will be all the more credit coming to the cook when you see all the things she can do with dried apricots and tapioca may i rummage sure assented billy dazedly moving aside so that she might reach the corner where three boxes were nailed by their bottoms to the wall curtained with a gaily flowered calico and used for a cupboard the pilgrim he began for the third time to explain went after grub and is taking his time getting back he'd oughta been here a day before yesterday we might eat his dog he suggested gathering spirit now that her back was toward him her face appeared at one side of the calico curtain i know something better than eating the dog she announced triumphantly down there in the willows where i crossed the creek i came down that low saggy place in the hill i saw a lot of chickens or something partridges maybe you call them roosting in a tree with their feathers all puffed out it's nearly dark but they're worth trying for don't you think that is if you have a gun she added as if she had begun to realize how meager were his possessions if you don't happen to have one we can do all right with what there is here you know billy flushed a little and for answer took down his gun and belt from where they hung upon the wall buckled the belt around his slim middle and picked up his hat if they're there yet i'll get some sure he promised you just keep the fire going till i come back and i'll wash the dishes here i'll shut the dog in the house he's always plumb crazy with ambition to do just what you don't want him to do and i don't want him following he smiled upon her again he was finding that rather easy to do and closed the door lingeringly behind him having never tried to analyze his feelings he did not wonder why he stepped so softly along the frozen path that led to the stable or why he felt that glow of elation which comes to a man only when he has found something precious in his sight i wish i hadn't at the last of that flour this morning he regretted anxiously i could have made some bread there's a little yeast powder left in the can darn the pilgrim end of chapter one chapter two of the long shadow by b m bower this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter 2. Prune Pie and Coon Can Of a truth, charming Billy Boyle, living his life in the wide lane that is too big and too far removed from the man-made world for any but the strong of heart, knew little indeed of women, her kind of women. When he returned with two chickens and found that the floor had been swept so thoroughly as to look strange to him, and that all his scattered belongings were laid in a neat pile upon the foot of the bunk which was unfamiliar under straightened blankets and pitifully plumped pillows he was filled with astonishment miss bridger smiled a little and went on washing the dishes it's beginning to storm isn't it she remarked but we'll eat chicken stew before we before i start home if you have a horse that i can borrow till morning father will bring it back Billy scattered a handful of feathers on the floor and gained a little time by stooping to pick them up one by one. I've been wondering about that, he said reluctantly. It's just my luck not to have a gentle hoss in camp. I got two, but they ain't safe for women. The pilgrims got one hoss that might have done if it was here, which it ain't. She looked disturbed, though she tried to hide it. I can ride pretty well, she ventured. Without glancing at her, Charming Billy shook his head. You're all right here. He stopped to pick up more feathers. And it wouldn't be safe for you to try it. One hoss is mean about mountain. You couldn't get within a rod of him. The other one is a holy terror to pitch when anything strange gets near him. I wouldn't let you try it. Charming Billy was sorry. That showed in his voice. But he was also firm. Miss Bridger thoughtfully wiped a tin spoon. 
Billy gave her a furtive look and dropped his head at the way the brightness had gone out of her face. They'll be worried at home, she said quietly. A little worry beats a funeral, Billy retorted sententiously, instinctively mastering the situation because she was a woman and he must take care of her. I reckon I could... He stopped abruptly and plucked savagely at a stubborn wing feather. Of course, you could ride over and bring back a horse, she caught eagerly at his half-spoken offer. It's a lot of bother for you, but I... I'll be very much obliged. Her face was bright again. You'd be alone here. I'm not the least bit afraid to stay alone. I wouldn't mind that at all. Billy hesitated, met a look in her eyes that he did not like to see there, and yielded. Obviously, from her viewpoint, that was the only thing to do. A cowpuncher who had ridden the range since he was sixteen should not shirk a night ride in a blizzard or fear losing the trail. It was not storming so hard a man might not ride ten miles, that is, a man like charming Billy Boyle. After that he was in great haste to be gone, and would scarcely wait until Miss Bridger, proudly occupying the position of cook, told him that the chicken stew was ready. Indeed, he would have gone without eating it if she had not protested in a way that made Billy foolishly glad to submit. As it was, he saddled his horse while he waited, and reached for his sheepskin-lined sourdough coat before the last mouthful was fairly swallowed. At the last minute, he unbuckled his gun belt and held it out to her. I'll leave you this, he remarked, with an awkward attempt to appear careless. You'll feel safer if you have a gun, and, and if you're scared of anything, shoot it. He finished with another smile that lighted wonderfully his face and his eyes. She shook her head. I've often stayed alone. There's nothing in the world to be afraid of, and anyway, I'll have the dog. Thank you all the same. Charming Billy looked at her, opened his mouth, and closed it without speaking. He laid the gun down on the table and turned to go. If anything scares you, he repeated stubbornly, shoot it. You don't want to count too much on that dog. He discovered then that Flora Bridger was an exceedingly willful young woman. She picked up the gun, overtook him, and fairly forced it into his hands. Don't be silly. I don't want it. I'm not such a coward as all that. You must have a very poor opinion of women. I, I'm i deadly afraid of a gun. Billy was not particularly impressed by the last statement, but he felt himself at the end of his resources and buckled the belt around him without more argument. After all, he told himself, it was not likely that she would have cause for alarm in the few hours that he would be gone, and those hours he meant to trim down as much as possible. Out of the coulee, where the high wall broke the force of the storm, he faced the snow and wind and pushed on doggedly. It was bitter riding that night, but he had seen worse, and the discomfort of it troubled him little. It was not the first time he had bent head to snow and driving wind, and had kept on so for hours. What harassed him most were the icy hills where the Chinook had melted the snow, and the north wind, sweeping over, had frozen it all solid again. He could not ride as fast as he had counted upon riding and he realized that it would be long hours before he could get back to the cabin with a horse from Bridger's. Billy could not tell when he first came to the impulse to turn back. It might have been while he was working his way cautiously up a slippery coulee side, or it might have come suddenly just when he stopped, for stop he did, just when he should logically have ridden faster because the way was smoother, and turned his horse's head downhill. If she'd a kept a gun, he muttered, apologizing to himself for the impulse, and flayed his horse with his rommel because he did not quite understand himself and so was ill at ease. Afterward, when he was loping steadily down the coulee bottom with his fresh-made tracks pointing the way before him, he broke out irreverently and viciously. A real old range rider you can bank on, one way or the other. But damn a pilgrim. The wind and the snow troubled him not so much now that his face was not turned to meet them but it seemed to him that the way was rougher and that the icy spots were more dangerous to the bones of himself and his horse than when he had come that way before. He did not know why he need rage at the pace he must at times keep, and it did strike him as being a foolish thing to do, this turning back when he was almost halfway to his destination. But for every time he thought that, he urged his horse more. 
the light from the cabin window twinkling through the storm cheered him a little which was quite as unreasonable as his uneasiness it did not however cause him to linger at turning his horse into the stable and shutting the door upon him when he passed the cabin window he glanced anxiously in and saw dimly through the half-frosted glass that miss bridger was sitting against the wall by the table tight-lipped and watchful he hurried to the door and pushed it open why hello greeted the pilgrim uncertainly the pilgrim was standing in the center of the room and he did not look particularly pleased charming billy every nerve on edge took in the situation at a glance kicked the pilgrim's dog and shook the snow from his hat i lost the trail he lied briefly and went over to the stove he did not look at miss bridger directly but he heard the deep breath which she took well so did i the pilgrim began eagerly with just the least slurring of his syllables i'd have been here before dark only one of the horses slipped and lamed himself it was much as ever i got home at all he come in on three legs and and toward the last them three like to went back on him which hoss asked billy though he felt pessimistically that he knew without being told the pilgrim's answer confirmed his pessimism of course it was the only gentle horse they had say billy i forgot your tobacco drawled the pilgrim after a very short silence which billy used for much rapid thinking ordinarily billy would have considered the oversight as something of a catastrophe but he passed it up as an unpleasant detail and turned to the girl it's storming something fierce he told her in an exceedingly matter-of-fact way but i think it'll let up by daylight so we can tackle it right now it's out of the question so we'll have another supper a regular blowout this time with coffee and biscuits and all those luxuries how are you on making biscuits so he got her out of the corner where she had looked too much at bay to please him and in making the biscuits she lost the watchful look from her eyes but she was not the floor bridger who had laughed at their makeshifts and helped cook the chicken and charming billy raving inwardly at the change in his heart damned fervently the pilgrim in the hours that followed billy showed the stuff he was made of he insisted upon cooking the things that would take the longest time to prepare boasted volubly of the prune pies he could make and then set about demonstrating his skill and did not hurry the prunes in the stewing he fished out a package of dried lima beans and cooked some of them changing the water three times and always adding cold water for all that supper was eventually ready and eaten and the dishes washed with miss bridger wiping them and with the pilgrim eyeing them both in a way that set on edge the teeth of charming billy when there was absolutely nothing more to keep them busy billy got the cards and asked miss bridger if she could play coon can which was the only game he knew that was rigidly two-handed she did not know the game and he insisted upon teaching her though the pilgrim glowered and hinted strongly at seven up or something else which they could all play i don't care for seven up miss bridger quelled speaking to him for the first time since billy returned i want to learn this game that uh billy knows there was a slight hesitation on the name which was the only one she knew to call him by the pilgrim grunted and retired to the stove rattled the lids ill-naturedly and smoked a vile cigar which he had brought from town after that he sat and glowered at the two billy did the best he could to make the time pass quickly he had managed to seat miss bridger so that her back was toward the stove and the pilgrim and he did it so unobtrusively that neither guessed his reason he taught her coon can two-handed whist and chinese solitaire before a gray lightning outside proclaimed that the night was over miss bridger heavy-eyed and languid turned her face to the window billy swept the cards together and stacked them with an air of finality i guess we can hit the trail now without losing ourselves he remarked briskly pilgrim come on out and help me saddle up we'll see if that old skate of yours is able to travel the pilgrim got up sullenly and went out and billy followed him silently his own horse had stood with the saddle on all night and the pilgrim snorted when he saw it but billy only waited till the pilgrim had put his saddle on the gentlest mount they had then took the reins from him and led both horses to the door all right he called to the girl helped her into the saddle and started off with not a word of farewell from miss bridger to the pilgrim the storm had passed and the air was still and biting cold 
the eastern sky was stained red and purple with the rising sun and beneath the feet of their horses the snow creaked frostily so they rode down the coulee and then up a long slope to the top struck the trail and headed straight north with a low line of hills for their goal and in the hour and a half of riding neither spoke a dozen words at the door of her own home billy left her and gathered up the reins of the pilgrim's horse well good-bye oh that's all right it wasn't any trouble at all he said huskily when she tried to thank him and galloped away End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Long Shadow by B. M. Bower This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn Chapter 3 Charming Billy Has a Fight If Billy Boyle had any ideals, he did not recognize them as such, and he would not have known just how to answer you if you had asked him what was his philosophy of life. He was range-bred, as purely western as were the cattle he tended, but he was not altogether ignorant of the ways of the world, past or present. He had that smattering of education which country schools and those of the county seat might give a boy who loves a horse better than books, and who, sitting hunched behind his geography, dreams of riding afar, of shooting wild things, and of sleeping under the stars. From the time he was sixteen, he had lived chiefly in tents and line camp cabins his world the land of far horizons of big sins and virtues bigger one creed he owned to live square fight square and to be loyal to his friends and his outfit little things did not count much with him and for that reason he was the more enraged against the pilgrim because he did not quite know what it was all about so far as he had heard or seen the pilgrim had offered no insult to miss bridger the girl as he called her simply in his mind still he had felt all along that the mere presence of the pilgrim was an offence to her no less real because it was intangible and not to be put into words and for that offence the pilgrim must pay but for the presence of the pilgrim he told himself ill-temperedly they might have waited for breakfast but he had been so anxious to get her away from under the man's leering gaze that he had not thought of eating and if the pilgrim had been a man he might have sent him over to bridger's for her father and a horse but the pilgrim would have lost himself or have refused to go and the latter possibility would have caused a scene unfit for the eyes of a young woman so he rode slowly and thought of many things he might have done which would have been better than what he did do and wondered what the girl thought about it and if she blamed him for not doing something different and for every mile of the way he cursed the pilgrim anew in that unfriendly mood he opened the door of the cabin stood a minute just inside then closed it after him with a slam the cabin in contrast with the bright light of the sun shining on the new-fallen snow was dark and so utterly cheerless and chill that he shrugged shoulders impatiently at its atmosphere which was as intangibly offensive as had been the conduct of the pilgrim the pilgrim was sprawled upon the bunk with his face in his arms snoring in a peculiarly rasping way that billy heavy-eyed as he was resented most unreasonably also the untidy table showed that the pilgrim had eaten unstintedly and billy was exceedingly hungry he went over and lifted a snowy boot to the ribs of the sleeper and commanded him bluntly to come alive what you want mumbled the pilgrim thickly making one word of the three and lifting his red-rimmed eyes to the other he raised to an elbow with a lazy doubling of his body and stared dully for a space before he grinned unpleasantly took her home all right did you he leered as if they were in possession of a huge joke of the kind which may not be told in mixed company if charming billy boyle had needed anything more to stir him to the fighting point that one sentence admirably supplied the lack you low-down skunk he cried and struck him full upon the insulting smiling mouth if i was as rotten-minded as you are i'd go drown myself in the stalest alkali hole i could find i don't know why i'm dirtying my hands on you you ain't fit to be clubbed to death with a tent pole he was however using his hands freely and to very good purpose probably feeling that since the pilgrim was much bigger than he there was need of getting a good start but the pilgrim was not the sort to lie on his bunk and take a thrashing he came up after the second blow pushing billy back with the very weight of his body and they were fighting all over the little cabin 
surging against the walls and the table and knocking the coffee pot off the stove as they lurched this way and that not much was said after the first outburst of billy's save a panting curse now and then between blows a threat gasped while they wrestled it was the dog sneaking panther-like behind billy and setting treacherous teeth viciously into his leathern chaps that brought the crisis billy tore loose and snatched his gun from the scabbard at his hip held the pilgrim momentarily at bay with one hand while he took a shot at the dog missed kicked him back from another rush and turned again on the pilgrim get that dog outdoors then he panted or i'll kill him sure the pilgrim for answer struck a blow that staggered billy and tried to grab the gun billy hooking a foot around a table leg threw it between them swept the blood from his eyes and turned his gun once more on the dog that was watching treacherously for another chance that's the time i got him he gritted through the smoke holding the pilgrim quiet before him with the gun but i got a heap more respect for him than i have for you you damned low-down brute i ought to kill you like i would a coyote you throw your traps together and light out of here before i forget and shoot you up there ain't room in this camp for you and me no more the pilgrim backed eyeing billy malevolently i never done nothing he defended sullenly the boss'll have something to say about this and i'll kill you first chance i get for shooting my dog it ain't what you done it's what you would a done if you had the chance answered billy for the first time finding words for what was surging bitterly in the heart of him and i'm willing to take a whirl with you any old time any dog that'd lick the boots of a man like you ought to be shot for not having more sense i ain't saying anything about him biting me which i'd kill him for anyhow now git i want my breakfast and i can't eat with any relish whilst you're spoiling the air in here for me at heart the pilgrim was a coward as well as a beast and he packed his few belongings hurriedly and started for the door come back here and drag your dog outside commanded billy and the pilgrim obeyed you'll hear about this later on he snarled the boss won't stand for anything like this i never done a thing and i'm going to tell him so ah go on and tell him you snapped billy only you don't want to get absent-minded enough to come back not whilst i'm here things unpleasant might happen he stood in the doorway and watched while the pilgrim saddled his horse and rode away when not even the pluckety pluck of his horse's feet came back to offend the ears of him charming billy put away his gun and went in and hoisted the overturned table upon his legs again a coarse earthenware plate which the pilgrim had used for his breakfast lay unbroken at the feet of him billy picked it up went to the door and cast it violently forth watching with grim satisfaction the pieces when they scattered over the frozen ground no white man'll ever have to eat after him he muttered to ease his outraged feelings still farther he picked up the pilgrim's knife and fork and sent them after the plate and knives and forks were not numerous in that particular camp either after that he felt better and picked up the coffee pot lighted a fire and cooked himself some breakfast which he ate hungrily his wrath cooling a bit with the cheer of warm food and strong coffee the routine work of the line camp was performed in a hurried perfunctory manner that day charming billy riding the high lines to make sure the cattle had not drifted where they should not was vaguely ill at ease he told himself it was the want of a smoke that made him uncomfortable and he planned a hurried trip to hardup if the weather held good for another day when he would lay in a supply of tobacco and papers that would last till round-up this running out every two or three weeks and living in hell till you got more was plumb worrisome and unnecessary on the way back his trail crossed that of a breed wolfer on his way into the bad lands billy immediately asked for tobacco and the breed somewhat reluctantly opened his pack and exchanged two small sacks for a two-bit piece billy rolling a cigarette with eager fingers felt for the moment a deep satisfaction with life he even felt some compunction about killing the pilgrim's dog when he passed the body stiffening on the snow poor devil you hadn't ought to expect much from a dog and he was a heap more white actin than what his owner was was his tribute to the dead it seemed as though when he closed the cabin door behind him he somehow shut out his newborn satisfaction a shack with one window is sure unpleasant when the sun is shining outside he said fretfully to himself this joint looks a heap like a cellar i wonder what the girl thought of it i reckon it looked pretty saucy to her and them with everything shining oh hell 
He took off his chaps and his spurs, rolled another cigarette, and smoked it meditatively. When it had burned down so it came near scorching his lips, he lighted a fire, carried water from the creek, filled the dishpan, and set it on the stove to heat. Darn a dirty shack, he muttered half apologetically, while he was taking the accumulation of ashes out of the hearth. For the rest of that day he was exceedingly busy, and he did not attempt further explanations to himself. He overhauled the bunk and spread the blankets out on the wild rose bushes to sun while he cleaned the floor. Billy's way of cleaning the floor was characteristic of the man, and calculated to be effectual in the main without descending to petty details. All superfluous objects that were small enough he merely pushed as far as possible under the bunk. Boxes and benches he piled on top. Then he brought buckets of water and sloshed it upon the worst places, sweeping and spreading it with a broom. When the water grew quite black, he opened the door, swept it outside, and sloshed fresh water upon the grimy boards. While he worked, his mind swung slowly back to normal, so that he sang crooningly in an undertone, and the song was what he had sung for months and years until it was a part of him and had earned him his nickname. Oh, where have you been, Billy boy, Billy boy? Oh, where have you been, charming Billy? I've been to see my wife. She's the joy of my life. She's a young thing and cannot leave her mother. Certainly it was neither musical nor inspiring, but Billy had somehow adopted the ditty and made it his own, so far as eternally singing it could do so, and his comrades had found it not unpleasant. For the voice of Billy was youthful, and had a melodious smoothness that atoned for much in the way of imbecile words and monotonous tune. He had washed all the dishes and had repeated the ditty fifteen times, and was for the sixteenth time tunefully inquiring, Can she make a pumpkin pie, charming Billy? When he opened the door to throw out the dishwater, and narrowly escaped landing it full upon the fur-coated form of his foreman. End of chapter 3「Four of the Long Shadow by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter Four. Canned. The foreman came in, blinking at the sudden change from bright light to half twilight, and Charming Billy took the opportunity to kick a sardine can of stove blacking under the stove where it would not be seen. Some predecessor with domestic instincts had left behind him half a package of rising sun and Billy had found it and was intending to blacken the stove just as soon as he finished the dishes. That he had left it as a crowning embellishment rather than making it the foundation of his house-cleaning only proved his inexperience in that line. Billy had batched a great deal, but he had never blacked a stove in his life. The foreman passed gloved fingers over his eyes, held them there a moment, took them away, and gazed in amazement. Since he had been foreman of the double crank, and the years were many, Charming Billy Boyle had been one of its top hands, and he had never before caught him in the throes of digging out. "'Fundamental furies!' swore he, in the unorthodox way he had. "'Looks like the pilgrim was right. There's a lady took charge here.' Charming Billy turned red with embarrassment, and then quite pale with rage. "'The pilgrim lied,' he denied sweepingly. The foreman picked his way over the wet floor in deference to his comparative cleanliness stepping long so that he might leave as few disfiguring tracks as possible, and unbuttoned his fur coat before the heat of the stove. "'Well, maybe he did,' he assented generously, gleaning a box from the pile on the bunk and sitting down. "'But it sure looks like corroborative evidence in here. How about it, Bill?' "'How about what?' countered Billy, his teeth close together. "'The girl, and the dog, and the fight.' but more especially the girl the pilgrim damn the pilgrim i wish i'd a killed the lion the girl's a lady and he ain't fit to speak her name she come here last night cause her hoss fell and got crippled and there wasn't a hoss i'd trust at night with her it was storming so hard and slippery and at daylight i put her on the gentlest one we had and took her home that's all there is to it there's nothing to gabble about and if the pilgrim goes around shooting off his face Billy clicked his teeth ominously. "'Well, that ain't just the way he told it,' commented the foreman, stooping to expectorate into the hearth and stopping to regard surprisedly its unwanted emptiness. "'He said—' "'I don't give a damn what he said,' snapped Billy. "'He lied, the low-down cur.' 
Uh huh. He said something about you shooting that dog of his. I saw the carcass out there in the snow. The foreman spoke with careful neutrality. I did. I wish now I'd laid the two of them out together. The dog tried to feed off of my leg. I shot the blame thing. Charming Billy sat down upon the edge of the table, sliding the dishpan out of his way, and folded his arms, and pushed his hat further back from his forehead. His whole attitude spoke impenitent scorn. I also licked the pilgrim and hazed him away from the camp, and told him particular not to come back, he informed the other defiantly. He did not add, What are you going to do about it? But his tone carried unmistakably that sentiment. And the pilgrim happens to be a stepbrother of the widow the old man is at present running after and aiming to marry. I was sent over here to put the can on to you, Billy. I hate like thunder to do it, but... The foreman waved a hand to signify his utter helplessness. The face of Billy stiffened perceptibly. Otherwise, he moved not a muscle. The old man says for you to stay till he can put another man down here in your place, though. He'll send Jim Bleeker soon as he comes back from town, which ain't apt to be for two or three days unless they're short on booze. Billy caught his breath, hesitated, and reached for his smoking material. It was not till he had licked his cigarette into shape and was feeling in his pocket for a match that he spoke. I've drawed wages from the double crank for quite a spell, and I always aim to act white with the outfit. It's more than they're doing by me, but I'll stay till Jim comes. He smoked moodily and stared at his boots. You ain't going back tonight, are you? The foreman said he must, and came back to the subject. You don't want to think I'm firing you, Billy. If it was my say-so, I'd tell the pilgrim to go to hell. But he went straight to headquarters with his tale of woe, and the old man is kind of uncertain these days, on account of not being right sure of the widow. He feels just about obliged to keep the pilgrim smoothed down. He ain't worth his grub, if you ask me. Oh, I ain't thinking nothing at all about it, Billy lied proudly. If the old man feels like canning me, that there's his funeral. I reckon maybe he likes the pilgrim's breed better for a change. And I wouldn't be none surprised if I could get a job with some other outfit, all right. I ain't aiming to starve, nor yet ride grub line. When you analyze the thing right down to fundamentals, observed the foreman, whom men called Jawbreaker for obvious reasons. It's a cussed shame. You're one of the oldest men with the outfit, and the pilgrim is the youngest, and the most inadequate. The old man ought to wait till he heard both sides of the case, and I told him so. But he couldn't forget how the widow might feel if he canned her stepbrother. And what's a man, more or less, in a case of that kind? Now look here, Jawbreaker, Billy protested cheerfully. Don't you go oozing comfort and sympathy on my account. I don't know but what I'm tickled to death. As you say, I work with this outfit for a blame long while, and it's maybe kind of hard on other outfits. They ought to have a chance to use me for a spell. There's no reason why the double crank should be a hog and keep a good man forever. The foreman studied keenly the face of Charming Billy, saw there an immobility that somehow belied his cheerful view of the case, and abruptly changed the subject. You've got things swept and garnished all right, he remarked, looking at the nearly clean floor with the tiny pools of dirty water still standing in the worn places. When did the fit take you? Did it come on with fever and chills, like most other breaking outs? Or did the girl... Ah, oh, the darn dog must up the floor, dying in here, Billy apologized weakly. I was plumb obliged to clean up after him. He glanced somewhat shamefacedly at the floor. After all, it did not look quite like the one where Miss Bridger lived. In his heart, Billy believed that was because he had no strip of carpet to spread before the table. He permitted his glance to take in the bunk, nakedly showing the hay it held for a softening influence and piled high with many things, the things that would not go beneath. Your sugans are gathering frost to beat the band, Bill, the foreman informed him, following his glance at the bunk. Your inexperience is something appalling for a man that has fried his own bacon and swabbed out his own frying pan as many times as you have. Better go bring him in. It was thinking about snowing again when I come. Billy grinned a little and went after his bedding, brought it, and threw it with a fine disregard for order upon the accumulation of boxes and benches in the bunk. I'll go feed the horses, and then I'll cook you some supper he told the foreman, still humped comfortably before the stove with his fur coat thrown open to the heat 
and his spurred boots hoisted upon the hearth. Better make up your mind to stay till morning. It's getting mighty chilly outside. The foreman, at the critical stage of cigarette lighting, grunted unintelligibly. Billy was just laying hand to the doorknob when the foreman looked toward him in a manner of one about to speak. Billy stood and waited inquiringly. Say, Bill, drawled Jawbreaker, you never told me your name yet. The brows of Charming Billy pinched involuntarily together. I thought the pilgrim had wised ye up to all the details, he said coldly. The pilgrim didn't know. He says you never introduced him, and seeing it's serious enough to start you on the godly trail of cleanliness, I'm naturally taking a friendly interest in her, and— Ah, go to hell, snapped Charming Billy, and went out and slammed the door behind him so that the cabin shook. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of The Long Shadow by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter Five The Man from Michigan. How old is she, Billy Boy, Billy Boy? How old is she, Charming Billy? Twice six, twice seven, forty nine and eleven. She's a young thing and cannot leave her mother. Come on, you lazy old skate. Think I want to sleep out tonight when town's so close? Charming Billy yanked his pack pony awake and into a shuffling trot over the trail, resettled his hat on his head, sagged his shoulders again, and went back to crooning his ditty. Can she bake a pumpkin pie, Billy boy, Billy boy? Can she bake a pumpkin pie, charming Billy? She can bake a pumpkin pie, quick's a cat can wink her eye. Out ahead, where the trail wound aimlessly around a low sand ridge flecked with scrubby sage, half buried in gray snowbanks, a horse whinnied inquiringly. Barney, his own red roan, perked his ears toward the sound and sent shrill answer in that land and at that season travelers were never so numerous as to be met with indifference and billy felt a slight thrill of expectation all day or as much of it as was left after his late sleeping and later breakfast he had ridden without meeting a soul now he unconsciously pressed lightly with his spurs to meet the comer around the first bend they went and the trail was blank before them thought it sounded close billy muttered but with the wind where it is and the air like this sound travels farther i wonder past the point before them poked a black head followed slowly by a shambling horse whose dragging hoofs proclaimed his weariness and utter lack of ambition the rider billy decided after one sharp glance he had never seen before in his life and nothing lost by it either he finished mentally when he came closer if the riders had not willed it so the horses would mutually have agreed to stop when they met that being the way of range horses after carrying speech-hungry men for a season or two if men meet out there in the land of far horizons and do not stop for a word or two it is generally because there is bad feeling between them and horses learn quickly the ways of their masters hello greeted billy tentatively eyeing the other measuringly because he was a stranger pretty soft going ain't it he referred to the half-thawed trail yes hesitated the other glancing diffidently down at the trail and then up at the neighboring line of disconsolate low hills yes it is his eyes came back and met billy's deprecatingly almost like those of a woman who feels that her youth and her charm have slipped behind her and who does not quite know whether she may still be worthy your attention are you acquainted with this this part of the country well Billy had got out his smoking material from force of the habit with which a range rider seizes every opportunity for a smoke, and singled meditatively a leaf. Well, I kind of know it by sight, all right. And in his voice lurked a pride of knowledge inexplicable to one who has not known and loved the rangeland. I guess you'd have some trouble finding a square foot of it that I ain't been over, he added, mildly boastful. If one might judge anything from a face as blank as that of a china doll, both the pride and the boastfulness were quite lost upon the stranger. Only his eyes were wistfully melancholy. My name is Alexander P. Dill, he informed Billy quite unnecessarily. I was going to the Merton place. They told me it was only ten miles from town, and it seems as though I must have taken the wrong road somehow. 
Could you tell me about where it would be from here? Charming Billy's cupped hands hid his mouth, but his eyes laughed. Roads ain't so plenty around here that you've any call to take one that don't belong to you, he reproved when his cigarette was going well. If Hardup's a place you started from, and if they headed you right when they turned you loose, you've covered about eighteen miles and bent them into a beautiful quarter circle, and how you ever went and done it undeliberate gets me. You are now seven miles from Hardup and sixteen miles, more or less, from Merton's. He stopped to watch the effect of his information. Alexander P. Dell was a long man, an exceedingly long man, as Billy had already observed, and now he drooped so that he reminded Billy of shutting up a telescope. His mouth drooped also, like that of a disappointed child, and his eyes took to themselves more melancholy. I must have taken the wrong road, he repeated ineffectually. Yes, Billy agreed gravely. I guess you must have. It does kind of look that way. There was no reason why he should feel anything more than a passing amusement at this wandering length of humanity, but Billy felt an uncountable stirring of pity and a feeling of indulgent responsibility for the man. Could you direct me to the right road? Well, I reckon I could, Billy told him doubtfully. But it would be quite a contract under the circumstances. Anyway, your case is too near played. You better cut out your visit this time and come along back to town with me. You're liable to do a lot more wandering around till you find yourself plumb afoot. He did not know that he came near using the tone one takes toward a lost child. Perhaps, seeing I have come out of my way, I might as well, Mr. Dill decided hesitatingly. That is, if you don't mind. Oh, I don't mind at all, Charming Billy assured him airily. Of course, I own this trail. And the less it's tracked up right now in its present state, the better. But you're welcome to use it, if you're particular to trod soft and don't step in the middle. Alexander P. Dill looked at him uncertainly, as if his sense of humor were weak and not to be trusted offhand, turned his tired horse awkwardly in a way that betrayed an unfamiliarity with neck reining, and began to retrace his steps beside Charming Billy. His stirrups were too short, so that his knees were drawn up uncomfortably, and Billy, glancing sidelong down at them, wondered how the man could ride like that. He wasn't raised right around here, I reckon, Billy began amiably when they were well underway. No, oh no, I'm from Michigan. I only came out west two weeks ago. I, I'm thinking some of raising wild cattle for the eastern markets. Alexander P. Dill still had the wistful look in his eyes, which were unenthusiastically blue, just enough of the blue to make their color definite. Charming Billy came near laughing, but some impulse kept him quiet-lipped and made his voice merely friendly. Yes, this is a pretty good place for that business, he observed quite seriously. A lot of people are doing that same thing. Mr. Dill warmed pitifully to the friendliness. I was told that Mr. Merton wanted to sell his farm, ranch, and cattle, and I was going to see him about it. I would like to buy a place outright, you see, with the cattle all branded and everything. Billy suddenly felt the instinct of the champion. Well, somebody lied to you a lot, then, he replied warmly. Don't you never go near old Merton. In the first place, he ain't a cow man. He's a sheep man, on a small scale so far as sheep go, but on a sure enough big scale when you count his feelings. He runs about twelve hundred woolies, and is about as unpolite a cuss as I ever met up with. He'd a roasted you brown just for saying cattle at him and if you let out inadvertent that you took him for a cowman, the chance is he'd a took a shot at you. If you ask me, you was playing big luck when you went and lost the trail. I can't see what would be their object in misinforming me on the subject, Mr. Dill complained. You don't suppose that they had any grudge against Mr. Merton, do you? Charming Billy eyed him aslant and was merciful. I can't say, not knowing who they was that told you, he answered. They're liable to have a grudge again him, though. Just about everybody has, that ever bumped into him. It would appear that Mr. Dill needed time to think this over, for he said nothing more for a long while. Charming Billy half-turned once or twice to importune his pack-pony in language humorously querulous, but beyond that he kept silence, wondering what freakish impulse drove Alexander P. Dill to Montana to raise wild cattle for the eastern markets. 
the very simplicity of his purpose and the unsophistication of his outlook were irresistible and came near weaning charming billy from considering his own personal grievances for a grievance it was to be turned adrift from the double crank he who had come to look upon the outfit almost with proprietorship who for years had said my outfit when speaking of it who had set the searing iron upon sucking calves and had watched them grow to yearlings then to sleek four-year-olds who had at last helped prod them up the chutes into the cars at shipping time and had seen them take their long trail to chicago the trail from which for them there was no return who had thrown his rope on kicking striking bronx had worked with the sweat gleaming like tears down his cheeks to gentle them had with much patience taught them the feel of the saddle and cinch and had ridden them with much stress until they accepted his mastery and became the dependable wise old cow horses of the range who had followed spring summer and fall the wide wandering of the double crank wagons asking nothing better secure in the knowledge that he charming billy boyle was conceded to be one of the double crank's top hands it was bitter to be turned adrift and for such a cause because he had fought a man who was something less than a man it was bitter to feel that he had been condemned without a hearing he had not dreamed that the old man would be capable of such an action even with the latest and least valued comer he felt the sting of it the injustice and the ingratitude for all the years he had given the double crank it seemed to him that he could never feel quite the same toward another outfit or be content riding horses which bore some other brand i suppose you're quite familiar with raising cattle under these western conditions alexander p dill ventured after a season of mutual meditation kinda billy confirmed briefly there seems to be a certain class prejudice against strangers out here i can't understand it and i can't seem to get away from it i believe those men deliberately misinform me for the sole reason that i am unfortunately a stranger and unfamiliar with the country they do not seem to realize that this country must eventually be more fully developed and that in the very nature of things strangers are sure to come and take advantage of the natural resources and aid materially in their development i don't consider myself an interloper i came here with the intention of making this my future home and of putting every dollar of capital that i possess into this country i wish i had more i like the country it isn't as if i came here to take something away i came to add my might to help build up not to tear down and i can't understand the attitude of men who would maliciously it's kind of got to be part of the scenery to josh a pilgrim billy took the trouble to explain we don't mean any harm i reckon you'll get along all right once you get wised up do you expect to be in town for any length of time mr dill's voice was wistful as well as his eyes somehow you don't seem to adopt that semi-hostile attitude and i-i'm very glad for the opportunity of knowing you charming billy made a rapid mental calculation of his present financial resources and of past experience in the rate of depletion well i may last a week or so and i might pull out tomorrow he decided candidly it all depends on the kind of luck i have mr dill looked at him inquiringly but he made no remark that would betray curiosity i have rented a room in a little house in the quietest part of town the hotel isn't very clean and there's too much noise and drinking going on at night i couldn't sleep there i should be glad to have you share my room with me while you stay in town if you will it is clean and quiet charming billy turned his head and looked at him queerly at his sloping shoulders melancholy face and round wistful eyes and finally at the awkward hunched-up knees of him billy did not mind night noises and drinking to be truthful there were two of the allurements which had brought him townward and whether a room were clean or not troubled him little he would not see much of it his usual procedure while in town would he suspected seem very loose to alexander p dill it consisted chiefly of spending the nights where the noise clamored loudest and of sleeping during the day sometimes where was the most convenient spot to lay the length of him he smiled whimsically at the contrast between them and their habits of living much obliged he said i expect to be some busy but maybe i'll drop in and bed down with you once i hit town it's hard to tell what i may do i hope you feel perfectly free to come at any time and make yourself at home mr dill urged lonesomely sure 
There's the old bird. I do plumb enjoy seeing the sun making gold on a lot of the town windows like that over there. It sure looks good when you've been living by your high lonesome and not seeing any window shine but your own little six by eight, huh? I, I must admit, I like better to see the sunset turn my own windows to gold, observed Mr. Dill softly. I haven't any now. I sold the old farm when mother died. I was born and raised there. The woods pasture was west of the house, and every evening when I drove up the cows and the sun was setting, the... The kitchen windows. Alexander P. Dill stopped very abruptly, and Billy, stealing a glance at his face, turned his own quickly away and gazed studiously at a bald hilltop off to the left. So finely tuned was his sympathy that for one fleeting moment he saw a homely, hilly farm in Michigan with rail fences and a squat old house with wide porch and hard beaten path from the kitchen door to the well and on to the stables and down a long slope that was topped with great old trees alexander p dill shambling contentedly driving with a crooked stick three mild-mannered old cows the blame chump what are you going to pull out for he asked himself fretfully then aloud i'm going to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with the cook at the hotel and if he don't give us a real old round-up beefsteak flopped over on a bare stove lids there'll be things happen i'd hate to name over he can sure do the business, all right. He used to cook for the double crank. And you, he turned elaborately cheerful to Mr. Dill, you are my guest. Thank you, smiled Mr. Dill, recovering himself and never guessing how strange was the last sentence to the lips of charming Billy Boyle. I shall be very glad to be the guest of somebody once more. You poor old devil. You sure drifted a long ways off your home range, mused Billy. Out loud, he only emphasized the arrangement with, Sure thing. End of chapter 5enjoying his enforced vacation very much. To tell the plain truth, and to tell it without the polish of fiction, he was hilariously moistened as to his gullet, and he was not thinking of quitting yet. He had only just begun. He was sitting on an end of the bar in the hard-up saloon, his hat as far back on his head as it could possibly be pushed with any hope of it staying there at all. He had a glass in one hand, a cigarette in the other, and he was raking his rowels rhythmically up and down the erstwhile varnished bar in buzzing accompaniment, the while he chanted with much enthusiasm, How old is she, Billy boy, Billy boy? How old is she, charming Billy? Twice six, twice seven, forty-nine and eleven. The bartender wiping the bar after an unsteady sheep herder was careful to leave a generous margin around the person of charming Billy who was at that moment asserting with much emphasis, She's a young thing and cannot leave her mother. Twice six, twelve, and twice seven's fourteen. And twelve and fourteen's, uh, twelve and fourteen. The unsteady sheep herder was laboring earnestly with the problem. She ain't no spring chicken, she ain't. <laughs> He laughed tipsily and winked up at the singer, but Billy was not observing him and his mathematical struggles. He refreshed himself from the glass, leaving the contents perceptibly lower. It was a large, thick glass with a handle, and it had flecks of foam down the inside. Took a pull at the cigarette and inquired plaintively, Can she brew, can she bake, Billy boy, Billy boy? Can she brew, can she bake, charming Billy? Another long pull at the cigarette, and then the triumphant declaration. She can brew and she can bake, she can sew and she can make. She's a young thing and cannot leave her mother. She ain't young, bawled the sheep herder, who was taking it all very seriously. Say them numbers over again once. Twelve and fourteen. Ah, go off and lay down advised Charming Billy, in a tone of deep disgust, 
he was about to pursue still further his inquiry into the housewifely qualifications of the mysterious young thing, and he hated interruptions. Can she make a pumpkin pie, Billy boy, Billy boy? Can she make a pumpkin pie, charming Billy? The door opened timidly and closed again, but he did not see who entered. He was not looking. He was holding the empty, foam-flecked glass behind him imperatively, and he was watching over his shoulder to see that the bartender did not skimp the filling and make it two-thirds foam. The bartender was punctiliously lavish, so that a crest of foam threatened to deluge the hand of Charming Billy and quite occupied him for the moment. When he squared himself again and buzzed his spurs against the bar, his mind was wholly given to the proper execution of the musical gem. She can bake a pumpkin pie, quick's a cat can wink her eye. Something was going on over in the dimly lighted corner near the door. Half a dozen men had grouped themselves there, with their backs to Billy, and they were talking and laughing, but the speech of them was an unintelligible clamor, and their laughter a commingling roar. Billy gravely inspected his cigarette, which had gone cold, set down the glass, and sought diligently for a match. Ah, oh, come on and have one on me, bawled a voice peremptorily. You can't raise no wild cattle around this joint, lessen you wet up good with whiskey. Why, a feller as long as you, he needs a good jolt for every foot of you, and that's about fifteen when you're lengthened out good. Come on, don't be a damn chubber. You got to sample my hospitality. Hey, Tom, set out about a quarter your mildest for the daffy down dilly. He's dry clean down to his handmade socks. Charming Billy, having found a match, held it unlighted in his fingers and watched the commotion from his perch on the bar. In the very midst of the clamor towered the melancholy Alexander P. Dill, and he was endeavoring to explain, in his quiet, grammatical fashion. A lull that must have been an accident carried the words clearly across to Charming Billy. Thank you, gentlemen. I really don't care for anything in the way of refreshment. I merely came in to find a friend who has promised to spend the night with me. It is getting along towards bedtime. Have your fun, gentlemen, if you must, but I'm really too tired to join you. Make him dance, yelled the sheepherder, giving over the attempt to find the sum of twelve and fourteen. By gosh, you made me dance when I struck town. Make him dance. You go off and lay down, commanded Billy again and to emphasize his words, leaned and emptied the contents of his glass neatly inside the collar of the sheep herder. Cool down, you ba ba black sheep. The herder forgot everything after that, everything but the desire to tear limb from limb one charming Billy Boyle, who sat and raked his spurs up and down the marred front of the bar and grinned maliciously down at him. Go on off before I take you all to pieces, he urged wearily already regretting the unjustifiable waste of good beer. Quit your buzzing. I want to listen over there. Come on, have a drink, vociferated the hospitable one. You got to be sociable, or you can't stop in this man's town. So insistent was he that he laid violent hold of Mr. Dill and tried to pull him bodily to the bar. Gentlemen, this passes a joke, protested Mr. Dill, looking around him in his blankly melancholy way. I do not drink liquor. I must insist upon your stopping this horseplay immediately. Oh, it ain't no play, asserted the insistent one darkly. I mean it by thunder. It was at this point that Charming Billy decided to have a word. Here, break away there, he yelled, pushing the belligerent sheepherder to one side. Hands off that long person. That there's my dill pickle. Mr. Dill was released and Billy fancied hazily that it was because he so ordered. As a matter of fact, Mr. Dill, catching sight of him there, had thrown the men and their importunities off as though they had been rough-mattered boys. He literally plowed his way through them, and stopped deprecatingly before Billy. "'It is getting late,' he observed, mildly reproachful. "'I thought I would show you the way to my room, if you don't mind.' Billy stared down at him. "'Well, I'm going to be busy for a while yet.' he demurred. I got to lick this misguided son of a gun that's batting around wanting to eat me alive. And I got my eyes on your friend in the rear there that's saying words about you, Dilly. 
Looks to me like I'm going to be some occupied for quite a spell. You run along to bed, and don't you bother none about me. The matter is not so urgent, but what I can wait until you're ready, Mr. Dill told him quietly, but with decision. He folded his long arms and ranged himself patiently alongside Billy, and Billy, regarding him uneasily, felt convinced that though he tarried until the sun returned, Mr. Dill would stand right there and wait, like a well-broken range horse when the reins are dropped to the ground. Charming Billy did not know why it made him uncomfortable, but it did, and he took immediate measures to relieve the sensation. He turned fretfully and cuffed the clamorous sheepherder, who seemed to lack the heart for actual hostilities, but indulged in much recrimination and was almost in tears. "'Aw, oh, shut up,' growled Billy. "'A little more of that war talk, and I'll start in and learn you some manners. I don't want any more of it, you hear?' It is a fact that trifles sometimes breed large events. Billy, to make good his threat, jumped off the bar. In doing so, he came down upon the toes of Jack Morgan, the hospitable soul who had insisted upon treating Mr. Dill, and who had just come up to renew the argument. Jack Morgan was a man of uncertain temper, and he also had toes exceedingly tender. He struck out, missed Billy, who was thinking only of the herder, and it looked quite as though the blow was meant for Mr. Dill. After that, things happened quickly and with some confusion. Others became active one way or the other, and the clamor was great, so that it was easily heard down the street and nearly emptied the other saloons. When the worst of it was over, and one could tell for a certainty what was taking place, Charming Billy was holding a man's face tightly against the bar and was occasionally beating it with his fist, none too gently. Mr. Dill, an arm's length away, had Jack Morgan and one other offender clutched by the neck in either hand and was solemnly and systematically butting their heads together until they howled. The bartender had just succeeded in throwing the sheep herder out through the back door, and he was wiping his hands and feeling very well satisfied with himself. I ought to have fired him long ago when he first commenced building trouble, he remarked to no one in particular. The darn lamb liquor! He's broke and has been all evening. I don't know what made me stand for him long as I did. Billy, moved perhaps by weariness rather than mercy, let go his man and straightened up, feeling mechanically for his hat. His eyes met those of the melancholy Mr. Dill. If you're quite through, bang, went the heads. Perhaps we may as well, bang, leave this unruly crowd, bang, and go to our room. It is after eleven o'clock. Mr. Dill looked as though his present occupation was unpleasant but necessary, and as though, to please Billy, he could keep it up indefinitely. Charming Billy stood quite still, staring at the other and at what he was doing, and while he stared and wondered, something came into the heart of him and quite changed his destiny. He did not know what it was or why it was so. At the time he realized only a deep amazement that Mr. Dill, mild of manner, correct of speech and wistful-eyed should be standing there banging the heads of two men who were considered rather hard to handle certainly jack morgan was reputed a bad actor when it came to giving blows and while alexander p dill was a big man an enormous man one might say he had none of the earmarks of a fighting man it was perhaps his very calmness that won billy for good and all before, Charming Billy had felt toward him a certain amused pity. His instinct had been to protect Mr. Dill. He would never feel just that way again. Mr. Dill, it would seem, was perfectly well able to protect himself. Shall we go? Mr. Dill poised the two heads for another bang and held them so. By this time, everyone in the room was watching, but he had eyes only for Billy. Just as you say, Billy assented submissively. Mr. Dill shook the two with their faces close together, led them to a couple of chairs, and set them emphatically down. Now, see if you can behave yourselves, he advised, in a tone a father would have used toward two refractory boys. You have been acting boorishly and disgracefully all evening. It was you who directed me wrong today. You have not, at any time since I first met you, acted like gentlemen. I should be sorry to think this country held many such brainless louts, he turned inquiringly towards Charming Billy and nodded his head toward the door. Billy, stooping unsteadily for his hat, which he discovered under his feet, 
followed him meekly out. End of chapter 6「Seven of the Long Shadow by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter Seven, till hell's a skating rink. Charming Billy opened his eyes slowly, but with every sense at the normal degree of alertness, which was a way he had born of light sleeping and night watching. He had slept heavily from the feel of his head and he remembered the unwisdom of drinking four glasses of whiskey and then changing irresponsibly to beer. He had not undressed, it would seem, and he was lying across the middle of a bed with his spurred boots hanging over the edge. A red comforter had been thrown across him, and he wondered why. He looked around the room and discovered Mr. Dill seated in a large cane rocker, which was unquestionably not big enough for his huge person. His feet were upon another chair, and his hands folded inertly on his drawn-up knees. He was asleep, with his head lying against the chair back, and his face more melancholy than ever and more wistful. His eyes, Billy observed, were deep-sunk and dark-ringed. He sat up suddenly, did Billy, and threw off the cover with some vehemence. "'Darn me for a drunken chump!' he exclaimed and clanked over to the chair. "'Here, Dilly!' To save the life of him, he could not refrain from addressing him so. Why in thunder didn't you kick me awake and make me get off your bed? What did you let me do it for? And you settin' up all night. Oh, this is sure a hell of a note. Mr. Dill opened his eyes, stared blankly, and came back from his dreaming. You were so, so impatient when I tried to get you up, he explained in a tired voice. And you had a way of laying your hands on your revolver when I insisted. It seems you took me for a shepherd and were very unfriendly, so I thought it best to let you stay where you were. But I'm afraid you were not very comfortable. One can rest so much better between sheets. You would not, he added plaintively, even permit me to take your boots off for you. Charming Billy sat down upon the edge of the bed, all touched as he was and stared abstractedly at Mr. Dill. Perhaps he had never before felt so utterly disgusted with himself, or realized so keenly his shortcomings. Not even the girl had humbled him so completely as had this long, lank, sinfully grammatical man from Michigan. "'You sure got me where I live, Dilly,' he said slowly and haltingly, feeling mechanically for the makings of a smoke. "'Charming Billy Boyle ain't got a word to say for himself.' but if you ain't plumb sick and disgusted with the spectacle i've made of myself you can count on me till hell's a skating rink i ain't always this way i do have spells when i'm some lucid it was not much but such as it was it stood for his oath of allegiance alexander p dill sat up straight his long bony fingers which billy could still mentally see gripping the necks of those two in the saloon lying loosely upon the chair arms i hope you will not mention the matter again he said i realize this is not michigan and that the temptations are but we will not discuss it i shall be very grateful for your friendship and grateful snorted billy spilling tobacco on the strip of faded ingrain carpet before the bed grateful hell Mr. Dill looked at him a moment, and there was a certain keen man-measuring behind the wistfulness, but he said no more about the friendship of charming Billy Boyle, which was as well. That is why the two of them later sat apart on the sunny side of the hotel office, which was also a saloon, and talked of many things, but chiefly of the cattle industry as Montana knows it, and of the hopes and the aims of Alexander P. Dill. Perhaps also that is why Billy breathed clean of whiskey and had the bulk of his winter wages still unspent in his pocket. Looks to me, he was saying between puffs, like you'd have stayed back where you knew the lay of the land instead of drifting out here where it was all plumb strange to you. Well, several incidents influenced my actions, Mr. Dill explained quietly. I had always lived within twenty miles of my birthplace. I owned a general store in a little place near the old farm, and did well. The farm paid well also. Then mother died, 
and the place did not seem quite the same. A railroad was built through the town, and the land I owned there rose enormously in value. I had a splendid location for a modern store, but I could not seem to make up my mind to change. So I sold out everything, store, land, the home farm, and all, and received a good figure, a very good figure. I was very fortunate in owning practically the whole town site, the new town site, that is. I do not like these so-called booms, however, so I left and began somewhere else. I did not care to enter the mercantile business again, and our doctor advised me to live as much as possible in the open air. Mother died of consumption. So I decided to come west and buy a cattle ranch. I believed I should like it. I always liked animals. Uh-huh. So do I. It was not just what Charming Billy most wanted to say, but that much was perfectly safe and non-committal to say. Mr. Dill was silent a moment, looking speculatively across to the hard-up saloon, which was practically empty and therefore quite peaceful. Billy, because long living in the range made silence easy, smoked and said nothing. Mr. Boyle began Dill at last, in the hesitating way that he had used when Billy first met him. You say you know this country, and have worked at cattle raising for a good many years. Twelve, supplemented Charming Billy. Turned my first cow when I was sixteen. So you must be perfectly familiar with the business. I frankly admit that I am not familiar with it. You say you are at present out of employment, and so I am thinking seriously of offering you a position myself, as a confidential adviser, if you like. I really need someone who can accompany me about the country and keep me from such deplorable blunders as was yesterday's experience. After I have bought a place, I shall need someone who is familiar with the business and will honestly work for my interest and assist me in the details until I have myself gained a practical working knowledge of it. I think I can make such an arrangement to your advantage as well as my own. From the start, the salary would be what is usually paid to a foreman. What do you say? For an appreciable space, Charming Billy Boyle did not say a word. He was not stupid, and he saw in a flash all the possibilities that lay in the offer. To be next to the very top, to have his say in the running of a model cow outfit, and it should be a model outfit if he took charge, for he had ideas of his own about how these things should be done, to be foreman with the right to hire and fire at his own discretion. He turned, flushed and bright-eyed, to Dill. God knows why you cut me out for the job, he said in a rather astonished voice. What you've seen of me so far ain't been what I'd call a gilt-edged recommend. But if you're fool enough to mean it serious, it's as I told you a while back. You can count on me till they're cutting figure eights all over hell. That, according to the scientists who are willing to concede the existence of such a place, will be quite as long as I should be likely to have need of your loyalty observed Mr. Dill, puckering his long face into the first smile Billy had seen him attempt. He did not intimate the fact that he had inquired very closely into the record and the general range of qualifications of charming Billy Boyle, sounding, for that purpose, every responsible man in Hardup. With the newborn respect for him, bred by his peculiarly efficacious way of handling those who annoyed him beyond the limit, he was told the truth and recognized it as such. So he was not really as rash and as given over to his impulses as Billy, in his ignorance of the man, fancied. The modesty of Billy would probably have been shocked if he had heard the testimony of his fellows concerning him. As it was, he was rather dazed, and a good deal inclined to wonder how Alexander P. Dill had ever managed to accumulate enough capital to start anything, let alone a cow outfit, if he took on trust every man he met he privately believed that Dill had taken a long chance, and that he should consider himself very lucky, because he had accidentally picked a man who would not steal him blind. After that, there were many days of riding to and fro, canvassing all northern Montana in search of a location and an outfit that suited them and that could be bought. And in the riding, Mr. Dill became, under the earnest tutelage of Charming Billy, a shade less ignorant of range ways and of the business of raising wild cattle for the eastern markets. He even came to speak quite easily of outfits in all the nice shades of meaning which are attached to that hard-worked term. 
he could lay the saddle blanket smooth and unwrinkled slap the saddle on and cinch it without fixing it either upon the withers or upon the rump of his long-suffering mount he could swing his quirt without damaging his own person and he rode with his stirrups where they should be to accommodate the length of him all of which speaks eloquently of the honest intentions of dill's confidential adviser end of chapter seven chapter eight of the long shadow by b m bower this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tom penn chapter eight just a daydream charming billy rode humped over the saddle horn as rides one whose mind feels the weight of unpleasant thoughts twice he had glanced uncertainly at his companion opening his lips for speech twice he had closed them silently and turned again to the uneven trail mr dill also was humped forward in the saddle but if one might judge from his face it was because he was cold the wind blew chill from out of the north and they were facing it the trail they followed was frozen hard and the gray clouds above promised snow the cheekbones of dill were purple and the point of his long nose was very red tears stood in his eyes whipped there by the biting wind how far are we now from town he asked dispiritedly only about five miles billy cheered then as if trivial speech had made easier what he had in mind to say he turned resolutely toward the other you expect to meet old man robinson there don't you that was the arrangement as i understood it and you're thinking strong of buying him out this place appeals to me more than any of the others and yes it seems to me that i can't do better mr dill turned the collar of his coat up a bit further or fancied he did so and looked questioningly at billy you gave me leave to advise you where you needed it billy said almost challengingly and i'm going to call you right here and now if you take my advice you won't go making medicine with old romson any more he'll do you sure he's asking you double what the outfit's worth they all are it looks to me like they think you're just out here to get rid of your pile and the bigger chunk they can pry loose from you the better i was going to put you next before this only you didn't seem to take to any of the other places real serious so it wasn't necessary i realize that one cannot buy land and cattle for nothing dill chuckled it seemed to be that compared with the prices others have asked mr robinson's offer was very reasonable it may be lower than jacobs and wilter but that don't make it right well there were the two sevens he meant the seventy-seven but that was a mere detail i didn't get to see the owner you know i have written east however and should hear from him in a few days you ain't likely to do business with that layout cause i don't believe they'd sell at any price old robinson is the washout you want to ride around at present i ain't worrying about the rest right now he's a smooth old devil and he'll do you sure to this mr dill made no reply whatever he fumbled the fastenings of his coonskin coat tried to pull his cap lower and looked altogether unhappy and charming billy not at all sure that his advice would be taken or his warning heeded stuck the spurs into his horse and set a faster pace reflecting gloomily upon the trials of being a confidential adviser to one who in a perfectly mild and good-mannered fashion goes right along doing pretty much as he pleases it made him think somehow of miss bridger in the way she had forced him to take his gun with him when he had meant to leave it she was like dill in that respect nice and good-natured and smiling only dill smiled but seldom and yet always managing to make you give up your own wishes he wished vaguely that the wanderings of dill would bring them back to the double crank country instead of leading them always further afield he did not however admit openly to himself that he wanted to see miss bridger again yet he did permit himself to wonder if she ever played coon can with any one else or if she had already forgotten the game probably she had and well a good many other things that he remembered quite distinctly later when they had reached town were warmed and fed and even billy was thinking seriously of sleep dill came over and sat down beside him solemnly folded his bony hands upon knees quite as bony 
regarded pensively the generously formed foot dangling some distance before him and smiled his puckered smile i have been wondering william if you had not some plan of your own concerning this cattle raising business which you think is better than mine but which you hesitate to express if you have i hope you will feel quite free to uh, lay it before the head of the firm it may interest you to know that i have as you would put it failed to connect with mr robinson so if you have any ideas oh i'm burning up with them charming billy retorted in a way he meant to be sarcastic but which mr dill took quite seriously then i hope you won't hesitate now look here dilly expostulated he between puffs recollect it's your money that's going to feed the birds and it's your privilege to throw it out to suit yourself of course i might daydream about the way i'd start into the cow business if i were a millionaire i'm not a millionaire mr dill hastened to correct a couple of hundred thousand or so is about all well a fellow don't have to pin himself down to just so many dollars and cents not when he's building himself a pet dream and if a fellow dreams about starting up an outfit of his own it don't prove he'd make it stick in reality the tone of billy however did not express any doubt mr dill untangled his legs crossed them the other way and regarded the other dangling foot i should like very much he hinted mildly to have you tell me this er uh, daydream as you call it so charming billy tilted back in his chair and watching with half-shut eyes the intangible smoke wreath from his cigarette found words for his own particular air castle which he had builded on sunny days when the double crank herds grazed peacefully around him or on stormy nights when he sat alone in the line camp and played solitaire with the morning wind crooning accompaniment or on long rides alone when the trail was plain before him and the grassland stretched away and away to a far skyline and the white clouds sailed sleepily over his head and about him the meadowlark sang and while he found the words he somehow forgot dill long and lean and lank listening beside him and spoke more freely than he had meant to do when dill first opened the subject a few minutes before recollect this is just a daydream he began but if i was a millionaire or if i had two hundred thousand dollars and to me they don't sound much different i'd sure start a cow outfit right away immediately at once but i wouldn't buy out nobody i'd go right back and start like they did if they're real old timers i'd go down south into texas and i'd buy me a bunch of two-year-olds and bring em up here and turn em loose on the best piece of open range i know and i know a peach in a year or so i'd go back and do the same again and i'd keep it up whilst my money held out I'd build me a home ranch back somewhere in a draw in the hills where there's lots of water and lots of shelter and I'd get a bunch of men that savvy cow brutes put em on horses that wouldn't trim down their self-respect every time they straddled em and then I'd just ride around and watch myself get rich and he stopped and dreamed silently over his cigarette and then urged mr dill after a moment and then i'd likely get married and raise a bunch of boys to carry on the business when i got old and fat and too damn lazy to ride off a walk mr dill took three minutes to weigh the matter then musingly i'm not sure about the boys i'm not a marrying man myself but just giving a snap judgment on the other part of it i will say it sounds well feasible end of chapter eight Chapter Nine of *The Long Shadow* by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter Nine, the Double Crank. The weeks that followed immediately after bulged big with the things which Billy must do or have done. For to lie on one's back in the sun with one's hat pulled low, dreaming lazily and with minute detail the perfect supervision of a model cow outfit from its very inception up through the buying of stock and the building of corrals 
and the breaking of horses to the final shipping of great trainloads of sleek beef is one thing to start out in reality to do all that with the hundred little annoyances and hindrances which come not to one's dreaming in the sun is something quite different but with all the perplexities born of his changed condition and the responsibility it brought him billy rejoiced in the work and airily planned the years to come years in which he would lead alexander p dill straight into the ranks of the western millionaires years when the sun of prosperity would stand always straight overhead himself a joshua who would by his uplifted hands keep it there with never a cloud to dim the glory of its light for the first time in his life he rode over texas prairies and lost thereby some ideals and learned many things the while he spent more money than he had ever owned or ever expected to own as the preliminary to making his pet dream come true truth to tell it mattered little to billy boyle whether his dream came true for himself or for another so long as he himself were the chief magician so it was with a light heart that he swung down from the train at tower after his homing flight and saw dill conspicuous as a flagstaff waiting for him on the platform his face puckered into a smile of welcome and his bony fingers extended readily to grip painfully the hand of charming billy i'm very glad to see you back william he greeted earnestly i hope you are well and that you met with no misfortune while you were away i have been very anxious for your return as i need your advice upon a matter which seems to me of prime importance i did not wish to make any decisive move until i had consulted with you and time is pressing did you uh buy as many cattle as you expected to get it seemed to billy that there was an anxious note in his voice your letters were too few and too brief to keep me perfectly informed of your movements why everything was lovely at my end of the trail dilly only i fell down on them four thousand two-year-olds parts of the country were quarantined for scab and i went way around them places and i was too late to see the cattlemen in a bunch when they was at the association only you ain't likely to savvy that part of the business and had to chase em all over the country of course it was my luck to have em stick their prices up on the end of a pole where i didn't feel like climbing after em so i only contracted for a couple of thousand to be laid down in billings somewhere between the first and the tenth of june at twenty-one dollars a head it was the best i could do this year but next winter i can go down earlier before the other buyers beat me to it and do a lot better don't you worry dilly it ain't serious on the contrary dill looked relieved and billy could not help noticing it his own face clouded a little perhaps dill had lost his money or the bulk of it and they couldn't do all the things they had meant to do after all how else thought billy uneasily could he look like that over what should ordinarily be something of a disappointment he remembered that dill after the workings of the cattle business from the very beginning had been painstakingly explained to him just before billy started south had been anxious to get at least four thousand head of young stock on the range that spring something must have gone wrong maybe a bank had gone busted or something like that billy stole a glance up at the other shambling silently along beside him and decided that something had certainly happened and on the heels of that he remembered oddly that he had felt almost exactly like this when miss bridger had asked him to show her where was the coffee and there wasn't any coffee there was the same heavy feeling in his chest and the same i wrote you a letter three or four days ago on the third to be exact dill was saying i don't suppose it reached you however i was going to have you meet me in hardup but then your telegram was forwarded to me there and i came here at once i only arrived this morning i think that after we have something to eat we would better start out immediately unless you have other plans i drove over in a rig and as the horses have rested several hours and are none the worse for the drive i think we can easily make the return trip this afternoon you're the doctor assented billy briefly more uneasy than before and yet not quite at the point of asking questions in his acquaintance with dill he had learned that it was not always wise to question too closely where dill wished to give his confidence he gave it freely but beyond the limit he had fixed for himself was a stone wall masked by the flowers so to speak of his unfailing courtesy billy had once or twice inadvertently located that wall a great depression seized upon him and made him quite indifferent to the little pleasures of homecoming 
of seeing the grass green and velvety and hearing the familiar notes of the meadow larks and the curlews the birds had not returned when he went away and now the air was musical with them driving over the prairies seemed fairly certain of being anything but pleasant today with dill doubled awkwardly in the seat beside him carrying on an intermittent monologue of trivial stuff to which billy scarcely listened he could feel that there was something at the back of it all and that was enough for him at present he was not even anxious now to hear just what was the form of the disaster which had overtaken them while you were away dill began at last in the tone that braces one instinctively for the worst i met accidentally a man of whom i had heard but whom i had not seen in the course of our casual conversation he discovered that i was about to launch myself and my capital into the cattle business whereupon he himself made me an offer which i felt should not be lightly brushed aside they all did billy could not help flinging out half resentfully when he remembered that but for his timely interference dill would have been gulled more than once i admit that in my ignorance some offers advantageous only to those who made them appealed to me strongly but i believe you will agree with me that this is different in this case i am offered a full section of land with water rights buildings corrals horses wagons and all improvements necessary to the running of a good outfit and ten thousand head of mixed cattle just as they are now running loose on the range for three hundred thousand dollars i need only pay half this amount down a five-year mortgage at eight per cent on the property covering the remainder to be paid in five yearly installments falling due after shipping time now that you did not buy as much young stock as we had first intended i can readily make the first payment on this place and have left between ten and twelve thousand dollars to carry us along until we begin to get some returns from the investment i am anxious to have you look over the proposition and tell me what you think of it if you are in favor of buying we can have immediate possession ten days after the deal is closed i think the man said billy tilted his hat brim a bit to keep the sun from his eyes and considered gravely the proposition it was a great relief to discover that his fears were groundless and that it was only another scheme of dilly's another snare which he perhaps would be compelled in dill's interest to move aside he put the reins down between his knees and gripped them tightly while he made a cigarette it was not until he was pinching the end shut that he spoke if it's as you say and he meant no offense it looks like a good thing all right but you can't most always tell i'd have to see it say you might tell me where this bonanza is and what's the name of the brand if it's anywheres around here i ought to know the place all right alexander p dill must after all have had some sense of humor his eyes lost their melancholy enough almost to twinkle well the owner's name is brown he said slowly i believe they call the brand the double crank it is located located hell you think i don't know the cigarette ready to light as it was slipped from billy's fingers and dropped unheeded over the wheel to the brown trail below he took the reins carefully from between his knees straightened one that had become twisted and turned out upon the prairie to avoid a rough spot where a mud puddle had dried in hard ridges beyond he swung back again leaned and flicked an early horse fly from the ribs of the off horse touched the other one up a bit with his whip and settled back at ease tilting his hat at quite another angle oh where have you been billy boy billy boy oh where have you been charming billy he hummed in a carefree way that would have been perfectly maddening to any one with nerves i suppose i am to infer from your silence that you do not take kindly to the proposition observed mr dill in a colorless tone which betrayed the fact that he did have nerves i can take a josh all right billy stopped singing long enough to say for a steady-minded cuss you do have surprising streaks dilly and that's a fact you sprung it on me mighty smooth for not having much practice i'll say that for you mr dill looked hurt i hope you do not seriously think that i would joke upon a matter of business he protested well i know old brown pretty tolerable well and i ain't accusing him of ribbon up a big josh on you he ain't that bran i must confess i fail to get your point of view said mr dill with just a hint of irascibility in his voice 
there is no joke unless you are forcing one upon me now mr brown made me a bona fide offer and i have made a small deposit to hold it until you came and i could consult you we have three days left in which to decide for or against it it is all perfectly straight i assure you billy took time to consider this possibility well in that case and all jokes aside i'd a heap rather have the running of the double crank than be president and have all the newspapers hollering how president billy boyle got up at eight this morning and had ham and eggs for his breakfast and then walked around the block with the queen of england hanging on to his left arm or anything like that but what i can't seem to get percolated through me is why in god's name the double crank wants to sell well, that mr dill remarked his business instincts uppermost it seems to me need not concern us seeing that they will sell and at a price we can handle i reckon you're right would you mind saying over the details of the offer again mr brown dill cleared his throat offered to sell me a full section of land extending from the line fence of the home ranch east uh-huh now what the devil's his idea in that billy cut in earnestly the double crank owns about three or four miles of bottom land up the creek west of the home ranch wonder why he wants to hold that out i'm sure i don't know answered dill he did not mention that to me but confined himself naturally to what he was willing to sell oh it don't matter and all the range stuff you said ten thousand head and i believe he is reserving some thoroughbred stock which he had bought in the last year or two the stock on the range the regular range grade stock all goes as well as the saddle horses must be the widow said yes and wants him to settle down and be a gentle farmer decided billy after a moment we will meet him in hardup tonight or tomorrow dill observed as if he were anxious to decide the matter finally do you think we would better buy it was one of his little courtesy ways of saying we in discussing a business transaction just as though billy were one of the firm buy you bet your life we'll buy i wish the papers was all signed up and in your inside pocket right now dilly i'm going to get heart failure the worst kind if there's any hitch lord what luck then we will consider the matter as definitely settled said dill with a sigh of satisfaction brown cannot rescind now there is my deposit to bind the bargain i will say i shall have been sorely disappointed if you had not shown that you favored the idea it seemed to me to be just what we want oh that part but it seems to me that old brown is sure locoed to give us a chance at the outfit he's gone plumb silly his friends ought to appoint a guardian over him only i hope they won't get action till this deal is cinched tight with that billy relapsed into crooning his ditty but there were odd breaks when he stopped short in the middle of a line and forgot to finish and there was more than one cigarette wasted by being permitted to go cold and then being chewed abstractedly until it nearly fell to pieces beside him alexander p dill folded loosely together in the seat caressed his knees and stared unseeingly at the trail ahead of them and said never a word for more than an hour End of chapter nine